Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be told you about some of Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit You Can't Scare Me. Before revisiting it this week, You Can't Scare Me was one I really didn't remember, and I'm realizing it's almost more noteworthy when I actually remember these books. So many of these covers are super memorable, so I think I know the story, but then the actual plot just ends up being absent from my mind. You Can't Scare Me looked like it'd be a lot of fun, but it's essentially just a string of It's a Prank Bros Gone Wrong, performed by a weirdly jealous boy, who I'm pretty sure would find himself being radicalized by the internet if he existed today. If you never read this one, you're not missing much. When looking at the original cover, I think for sure it's one of the more memorable ones. Maybe because mod monsters aren't a super common horror creature, it's always stood out to me. I just love how mean and gross they look. Like, there's nothing cutesy about this cover, Jacobus was going for scary on this one. It's too bad that the tone of the book is literally the opposite, though. I just really like the way he conveys them rising out of the muck ready to wreak havoc. Also, enjoy this concept photo Jacobus used of himself for the cover. The 2004 version is fine. I think a common complaint I have about these reprint slime borders is that they just seem to make Jacobus' work smaller or cut out parts in general, and I don't like that. Also, ever since I learned about the whole blue-orange movie poster color theory thing, I noticed it whenever these colors are paired, and I think Jacobus' original color pairings tended to be more unique and interesting. The 2010 version is different for sure, but I really like it. These mud monsters look like they have some speed to them. The original one gives off kind of like slow zombie vibes, whereas these mud men look like they're from 28 days later. I also really like the stick in the middle of the one's forehead, and I just think this is a pretty fun cover. You Can't Scare Me had way more merchandise than anticipated this week, but I think that has to do with how great the original cover art is, because it's certainly not known for the actual quality of the story. The trading cards this time are a lot of fun. I'd love to know why the mud monster with the guitar became a thing, because he also pops up on this bookmark too. In addition to the usual pog and notebook, the mud monster made it onto some other fun things too, including a pair of twisted scissors like the ones from Stay Out of the Basement, as well as this little desk caddy for all your pens and pencils. The mud monsters also made it onto some gummy packages, and even a soda, which I am fascinated by and I want to know who made these things and what they taste like. The Mud Monster was iconic enough to earn himself a full-on Halloween costume, which I thought was kind of fun. There are also some random things like this freaky face, where the instructions say put your hand inside my head to make my face move. So is this like a puppet? The Mud Monster also got himself a window cling decoration, a tote bag, another tote bag and backpack, and even a collectible figurine. This is all pretty good for such a meh book. Our front tag says, they're coming for you. And my mind hopped to, they're coming to get you, Barbara, for some reason. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it! You're ignorant! They're coming for you, Barbara. The back take says, it's gonna be a scream. And to be honest, I wish this was true, because it's kind of a mildly amusing snore at best. Before we get into the summary, let's read the blurb on the back. Courtney is a total show-off. She thinks she's so brave, and she's always making Eddie and his friends look like wimps. But now Eddie's decided he's had enough. He's gonna scare Courtney once and for all, and he's come up with a perfect plan. He's gonna lure Courtney down to Muddy Creek, because Eddie knows Courtney believes the silly rumor about the monsters. Mud monsters that live in the creek. Too bad Eddie doesn't believe the rumor, because it might be true. The book begins with our introduction to Eddie, and his intense hatred for Courtney. I read the blurb on the back, so this hatred for Courtney sounds like it's a central theme for the book. Courtney's crimes so far include wanting to be first, being brave, and a show-off. Eddie kind of sounds like he suffers from the same inferiority complex as Gabe from Curse of the Mummy. Sorry boys, sorry and Courtney are just better than you, learn to deal with it. We also get to meet Eddie's best friend Hat. Yes, this boy's name is Hat because he always wears a baseball hat. His actual name is Herbie, which I think is pretty unique, but I guess wearing a hat a lot overrides that. The kids are on a field trip and we are just meeting all sorts of people, because now we're introduced to Mr. Melvin, who's a wannabe cool teacher according to Eddie, because he says things like, hey guys, cool it. I guess in the early 90s this was edgy for a teacher in Stein's eyes. We also meet Molly and Charlene. Molly has glasses and braces and loves chewing gum. Charlene's character traits so far are being the other girl. It looks like we have a Goosebumps friend situation again, all us say cheese and die. Let's just hope these kids are less annoying. We find out that Eddie is a ginger with flaming red hair and freckles. He also has the nickname Bugs because his two front teeth stick out like Bugs Bunny. Poor Hat isn't much of a looker and he's described as goofy looking, like Dopey from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. It's okay though, I'm sure he'll make up for this with his winning personality. Once at their destination, we get lots and lots of banter, and some casual violence amongst the children, as Hat smacks Charlene on the back hard enough to send her gum flying. This is all just to show us these are some fun loving cool kids I suppose. I don't like when Stein gets more than two kids together I'm realizing, because it just evolves into constant attempts of joking around. They are in Green Forest, and they're tasked with writing down any plant or wildlife they spot. This seems to be quite the challenge for Eddie for reasons unknown. Hat is uncertain which category Moss goes into, so maybe this field trip outdoors will do some good for him. 
Miss Prince encourages the kids to really wrestle up the nature to spot the animals, and tells the kids to look in holes, trees, and bushes if the nature doesn't want to come out on its own. Courtney ends up being the first to spot something cool by seeing a deer in the bushes, which Eddie holds against her for some reason. He also notes that she spotted four other animals, including a bat, which he also seems to have a problem with. How dare Courtney be observant and follow the instructions? Eddie is kind of a little prick because right after getting a glimpse into his simmering hatred for Courtney, he tries to shove Hat into a patch of poison ivy, but he fails and ends up tumbling. The name Hat keeps throwing me off because I watched Doctor Sleep last night, so I keep picturing Rose the Hat. Anyways, Eddie lands right next to a snake and is unable to scream in a chapter cliffhanger as it goes to bite him. To his absolute horror, the snake doesn't bite him, instead Courtney has a hold of it. What can't this girl do? She lightly mocks Eddie for being afraid of a harmless green snake, and Eddie has concluded she's ruined the field trip for him. He mopes through the forest until he reached the bus, and he notices a group of kids circled up, and immediately he thinks something bad happened to Courtney. This girl is living rent-free in Eddie's mind. It turns out Courtney is also a master showman and a beekeeper, because she's entertaining the crowd by letting two bumblebees walk around on her hand. This of course upsets Eddie, and he begins to beg for the bees to sting her in his mind. Courtney then pulls some shit and launches the bees at Eddie. He screams and dodges them, but one lands on Hat and he proceeds to freak out too. The events of this field trip have caused the entire class to turn against Eddie, because as he enters the bus everybody is hissing and buzzing at him. On the bus ride back to school, the four friends begin to brainstorm about how it could possibly scare Courtney. They just so happen to pass Muddy Creek during the brainstorming session, and we get some backstory on the town's legend of mud monsters. These mud monsters are werewolf-esque, because they only come out during a full moon, they're covered in mud and they try to pull people down into the muck with them. It also turns out that Eddie's older brother Kevin is making a movie on mud monsters, so I'm sure that will come into play at some point. It sounds like we're getting set up for a mud monster trap for Courtney, but Molly then suggests an uninspired rubber snake. They plan to stick the rubber snake in Courtney's lunch bag, and that's the extent of this elaborate prank. We then pause to comment that Courtney is also a perfect student, and Eddie just can't handle that Courtney is his superior in every way. The next day we actually jump straight into another one of Courtney's crimes, because apparently Courtney has the biggest lunch in the class, and she became the big hero at lunchtime because she shared with kids with crummy lunches. Add generous to Courtney's list of character flaws, right next to intelligent, brave, and confident. Molly has supposedly stuffed this fake snake into Courtney's lunch bag, and Eddie can't concentrate for the next three hours because he keeps drifting into these pathetic fantasies like this one. I pictured Courtney shrieking in fright, everyone else laughing at her, making fun of her. I imagined myself, walking over casually and picking up the snake. Why it's only rubber Courtney, I'd say holding it up high so everybody could see. You shouldn't be afraid of rubber snakes, they're harmless, perfectly harmless. What a victory. Even in his hero daydreams, Eddie is incapable of being clever. This prank shockingly backfires massively, but not in the way I thought it would. I figured it'd end up in Eddie's lunch somehow, but instead Mr. Melvin ends up opening Courtney's lunch and freaking out. To make matters worse, Courtney leaps into action and heroically stomps the rubber snake until its head pops off. Fierce hard stomps. Heroic stomps. While sulking his way home, Eddie suddenly is stalked by a frightened neighbor who wants Eddie to climb a tree to save her cat Muttley. This is not great for Eddie because he's afraid of climbing trees himself and not really feeling up to the task while thinking, so what if he falls? Aren't cats supposed to have nine lives? Eddie is unpleasant. We then get a chapter cliffhanger where the cat is about to fall to its death, only to hang on at the last second and add more urgency to the situation, so Eddie needs to hustle up that tree. The neighbor is getting ready to call the fire department because Eddie is not rising to the task when suddenly Courtney appears. She climbs up the tree with ease and grabs the cat without issue. She then calls Eddie and his friends out for trying to scare her with a rubber snake. She confidently strides off, leaving the group to mutter about how they need to scare her still. Courtney is comically better than the rest of these kids, and unbothered. I love it. This time, Eddie and his friends decide the best way to scare Courtney is by putting a live tarantula down her back. I'm curious to see who in this group is going to be brave enough to even touch the tarantula, but this setup is simple. Steal a tarantula from the science room, get Courtney under a balcony, and drop the poor creature on her head in hopes that it gets tangled in her hair. I look forward to seeing this backfire on Eddie. We spend a chapter as Tweedledee and Tweedledum break into the science room and attempts to steal this tarantula. Eddie and Hat, being the masterminds that they are, realize that they didn't bring anything to put the tarantula in, but luckily they find some Tupperware for it. Eddie is terrified of this thing because he can barely hold the container still as Hat puts the tarantula in. We get a chapter cliffhanger as the boys are almost caught by the teacher and have to hide. This next part is great though. The boys dive into a supply cabinet to avoid the teacher. This is successful and the teacher shuts off the lights and leaves the room. They then go to leave the cabinet only to realize they've locked themselves in. This would set off my claustrophobia immediately and that teacher would hear me holler in from the parking lot. To make it even better though, the tarantula gets out and is now loose in the cabinet with the boys as they're locked in. This all ends too soon sadly and Eddie is able to bust the door open with his shoulder before the tarantula can do any real damage and Hat puts it back in the container. 
We then cut to the next day where we enter phase two of this prank, where the friend group is trying to get Courtney under the balcony in the gym so they can plop the spider onto her. This all goes pretty quick and we get a chapter ending with Hat dropping the tarantula onto Courtney, who of course he misses and it lands right in Molly's hair, and poor Molly does not handle this well. Molly was screaming a lot louder. Her face was red as a tomato, her eyes were bulging out of her head, she was shrieking at the top of her lungs and doing a strange dance, hopping wildly up and down with her hands thrashed in the air. Poor Molly was tearing at her hair now, still shrieking and hopping around. Courtney then calmly picks up the spider to prevent it from being smashed by basketballs and or Molly and Charlene. She then educates the crowd on how tarantulas don't bite often, and if they do it doesn't hurt that much. Eddie and Hack get caught by the gym teacher and have to spend the next two weeks cleaning the science room. Eddie laments that all of this is Courtney's fault as usual, even though Courtney's just out there living her best life. That night, as he falls asleep, Eddie tells himself she's really asking for it, which is not a great turn of phrase. As Eddie is falling asleep, his little incel self suddenly is terrified by a tall monster in the doorway with dark blood dripping from its mouth. This ends up being his brother Kevin, who is in full drippy bud monster costume in the middle of the house. Eddie then begins asking him for ideas on how to scare Courtney, with neither of them really going to the obvious solution, mud monster. Kevin thinks the issue is that the snakes and tarantulas are too small and he needs to go bigger. Eddie deduces that this means elephants, but Kevin clarifies no, more like a large vicious dog. But yes, let's release a vicious dog on Courtney for daring to be better than Eddie. Surprisingly, this idea doesn't stay on the drawing board, and we jump to the friend group plotting on how to obtain a large vicious dog to release on Courtney in the middle of the woods. I feel like this book is from the villain's perspective, and it's kind of fun if you root against Eddie. It's also worth noting that these kids are hanging out playing croquet, you know, like kids do. Charlene suggests Buttercup, her Saint Bernard, and they all conclude that he couldn't be scary enough because clearly these kids haven't seen or read Cujo. They decide to stereotype some other breeds instead and try to figure out where they could get a Doberman or a German Shepherd. Charlene cuts them off and shows them that Buttercup knows a scary trick. She begins whistling and Buttercup starts growling and baring his teeth and really going full Cujo like he was born to. This scares Eddie in a chapter cliffhanger because he thinks Buttercup is going to maul him, but then Charlene stops whistling and the dog reverts back to lovable. Apparently Buttercup learned this trick on his own and just naturally hates whistling. No one is concerned about this. They decide the plan is to get Courtney in the woods and release Buttercup on her while whistling. They get sloppy though and decide to call Courtney and have Molly pretend to be Courtney's friend Denise. This doesn't go great because Denise happens to be home with Courtney too, so they're like whoops wrong number and hang up. I would star 69 their ass. We then spend a very long time before getting to anything interesting. Eventually it's been a week and the kids are in the woods hoping to scare Courtney and Denise in their treehouse that they just happen to have out there. They have Buttercup ready to go and even put shaving cream on his jowls to make him look rabid, thus giving him the full Cujo. Ed reports that the girls are in the woods and the plan moves into action. This goes sideways before it even gets properly started because Buttercup sees a squirrel and takes off after it instead, and we end the chapter with Buttercup now being lost in the woods. Eddie is a toxic personality because now he's moved on to blaming the dog for his troubles, stating, how could that dumb dog mess up like this? How could he be so irresponsible? Eddie realizes he's lost, but more in a dead house way than in a fever swamp way because this gets resolved very quickly. But not before out of sheer coincidence he almost gets attacked by a different large dog in the woods in a chapter cliffhanger. This book is really lacking in a lot of ways, like I'm enjoying how awful Eddie is, but as far as plot goes it's paper thin and the scares are non-existent. This random dog attack just kind of shows how empty this book is, like Stein was thinking, hmm, better throw something in. I know, how about a dog attack from a different dog? That's unexpected. We end the chapter with Courtney standing at the edge of the woods with Buttercup and this other mystery dog, which she declares is a sweetheart, so Courtney just so happens to find two lost dogs in the woods, there's truly nothing she can't do. We're on page 88 and these kids still haven't given up on their quest to scare Courtney. They are now hanging out in a den working on plan number 4. They don't come up with anything and on his way home, Eddie fantasizes about cold hands grabbing Courtney on the neck to scare her. Eddie is well on his way to incel killer with these thoughts. Daydreaming about choking a girl who makes you feel insecure is not a great path to follow Eddie Jesus Christ. In another example of Stein just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks, Eddie is suddenly intensely scared by some mysterious shadow moving in the weeds and he thinks it's coming after him in a chapter cliffhanger. He races home and it turns out that it's literally nothing. Eddie just scared himself in the dark out of the blue. This ordeal gives him the brilliant idea to scare Courtney at night though, so I guess it wasn't all for nothing. We hop to a class morning meeting the next day and we get some more examples of Courtney's crimes. She's a morning person who loves participating in class discussions. The discussion of the day is about monsters, and we learn that Courtney believes in the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot, so this gives Eddie an idea. Although he just won't come out and say it because we need to drag this for 20 more pages I guess, it better have to do with Mud Men because this cover is going nowhere. Eventually we learn that the group of kid villains have convinced brother Kevin and his friends to dress up as Mud Monsters to scare Courtney with the compelling argument she was asking for it, and by offering to do his chores for a month. The grand plan ends up being to get Courtney into the treehouse at night so Kevin and his friends can attack the treehouse dressed as mud monsters. 
we get further clarification on what mud monsters are, and it's not really necessary or interesting. About a hundred years ago, a flood washed away poor villagers, and now once a year on the full moon they rise up from the mud and attack people as half-dead mud monsters. The brother and his friends get all dressed up and head off into the woods. This is when Eddie reveals he still has to get Courtney to the treehouse. You'd think that'd be the very first thing they planned, but I'm convinced this book needed more filler to reach 120 pages. They get Courtney to the woods by playing on her love of monsters and desire to be fearless by telling her that the mud monster is supposed to be out that night, but they understand if she's too chicken to check it out. This works, thankfully, and hopefully we get to see some mud monsters or at least what the point of this book is. In the woods, the four villain children are spying on Courtney and Denise in the treehouse. Eddie mocks Courtney for always having to be the perfect scientist because she brought a camera with her to see the mud men. While in the bushes, they hear some soft moans in the distance. To their delight, they see three mud monsters rise up and approach the back of the treehouse. Courtney and Denise have no idea they're there, and Eddie is having a grand time. He turns around and spots his brother and his two friends, who inform him they had a flat tire. This of course means that the mud monsters approaching Courtney and Denise must be real. Suddenly, dozens rise up from the mud. Eddie yells at the two girls to run away, which they do. All the kids flee from the woods, running and screaming in terror. We cut to two weeks later, and everyone is alive, which surprised me because as the final scene was happening, I kind of thought I remembered Courtney being taken by the mud monsters, but nope. Courtney is alive and fearless as ever, telling everybody she saw the monsters and that they're real. Eddie and his friends, on the other hand though, have become full-on traumatized and don't even want to leave their houses anymore. They still want to scare Courtney, but they can't, they're just too scared, and then that's how it ends. I don't remember seeing this episode, because I'm pretty sure these mud monsters would have left an impression on me. In keeping with the theme, Charlotte Sullivan, who played Courtney, is the most notable actor from this episode because she's gone on to be in a ton of movies and TV shows, while the boys have just vanished from acting. The episode is already better than the book by opening with some mud monster action. I like that Eddie remains a little prick in the episode too. Do you have proof that monsters exist? Yeah, you're looking at one. His name's Courtney. Yeah. A snake? Don't be such a chicken. It's for her. Uh huh. A snake for a snake. Exactly. That's he really just launches that snake right at the kids. I don't understand this hose. Is sports mud? Hey. Hat is not a great friend. sure what this even was. I'll be there. I promise. This would be very uncomfortable. How come I have to be the mud monster? Because it was my idea. It'll just hold still. That's better. These mud effects are great. is our fashionista for sure. Isn't it interesting? Courtney is even better than in the book. Here we have two adolescents of average or below intelligence trying to outwit an adolescence of much higher than average intelligence. I'm not bragging, I'm just stating the facts. I think it's great that she lectured it to death. Oh, a mud monster! A mud monster is behind me, I see. Uh, uh, don't interrupt. I can feel your anger. 
can't expect sympathy from people if you're always attacking them, you know. Well-adjusted monsters just don't do those sorts of things. At least do something about your impulsive behavior. Hear me out. Hello there. Hello. Are you even listening to me? The mud monsters coming back to life in the rain is a fun idea, and the episode in general is just a lot more fun than the book. I just gotta tell you, Betty, life just isn't fair. Oh, thanks, man. Overall, I thought You Can't Scare Me was a pretty weak book. It's definitely a change of pace both plot-wise and by having such an unlikable protagonist. I have no idea if Stein wanted us to like Eddie, but I didn't. The highlight for me was when Eddie was trapped in the closet with the spider, but I can't shake the feeling that this book was built around the idea for one scene, the one where Eddie turns around and sees his brother behind him, so surprise, the monsters are real. The rest of the book just seems like filler to get to that singular part. So I'm going to give this one 2 out of 5 St. Bernard's. Okay, let's move on to our Goosebumps totals. There were no shoulder scares, it's only a dreams, anything notable from the 90s, or anything to add to the vomit count, but it did have frequent pranks. In It's a Prank Bro, we had a total of four pranks. These included Courtney flinging the bees, the rubber snake, the spider escapade, and the attempt at Cujo. This brings our series total to 26 pranks. As far as asshole victims go, I'm going to go ahead and say that we had a total of four and you can't scare me. Eddie, Hat, Molly, and Charlene were all obsessive jerks in their attempts to scare Courtney, only to end up traumatized by their own scare prank. This brings our series total to 14 asshole victims. You Can't Scare Me had a total of 11 chapter cliffhangers, and they were largely unremarkable. This raises our goosebumps total to 183. The clunky cliffhanger award for this book goes to chapters 19 to 20, where Eddie suddenly scares himself out of nowhere on his walk home, only for it to literally be nothing. Shocker ending. Our big twist to this story was the mud monsters being real, but that doesn't happen in the last chapter, so it doesn't feel like a proper shocker ending. I suppose I could count Eddie being the one who ended up scared as a twist, but really, he's scared of everything throughout this whole book. This keeps our Goosebumps series total at 10. Well that's it for You Can't Scare Me. I enjoyed like two parts of this book, otherwise it wasn't great. I'm super excited for next week's One Day at Horrorland, because I remember loving that episode and the book as a kid. I think it also features another tarantula in an enclosed space actually. Be sure to let me know what you thought of You Can't Scare Me in the comments. Am I being overly critical on this one? Do you think Eddie got what he deserved? Also, what did you think of my mishmash of clips this week? I tried to follow some of the plot points of this book, but it was tricky considering this book is basically just repeated failed pranks. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.